As we go back in history, in modern societies, we create uh, an important and ambivalent resource. On the one hand, our uh, turning back to the past may uh, help us uh, to change the present and uh, and uh, mm, help grow trust. Uh, uh, it may strengthen us uh, in our moral choices uh, or creating a cultural um, milieu, or in or even in some cases uh, be. Uh, converted into the economic uh, growth. But on the other hand, turning uh, uh, to the past may breed conflict, uh, may justify war, may justify terrorism, may uh, lead to spontaneous outbursts of hatred, enmity, and uh, uh, and indeed uh, grow into the system of extermination most terribly. And this is also something that we have seen throughout history. Um, so it is difficult for me to imagine that such an expressive view uh, of the past um, would uh, would be uh, characteristic for, say, the classical Greeks. At least we do not have uh, this documented. It is difficult to imagine something like that in the Middle Ages, uh, which means that the phenomenon which we are deliberating today is uh, something which is uh, um, uh, emerging on the cusp uh, of modern history over the past uh, two to three hundred years uh, in mid-18th century or around the time. And uh, while the main fruits um, are being reaped uh, in, uh, in the 20th century from the standpoint of such uh, a treatment of history, I would uh, propose uh, to see and to try to consider what has changed uh, in, uh, in uh, our treatment of history over the past two to three hundred years. And what is this phenomenon of modern view of history? Mikhail Bakhtin um, uh, once uh, used uh, the term of historical inversion. The inversion and in the modern societies, uh, what is um, uh, uh, historical inversion? Uh, in modern societies, the view of the of the golden age uh, of these ideal states of the human society migrate from mythology, uh, from uh, religious imagination or from um, other forms of imagination into history, into the historical narratives. And in through this, um, uh, this is, which is happening in, in the modern times, um, and these ideal um, states uh, are being uh, ascribed uh, with the uh, quality of the past or the future. Uh, and uh, history is then viewed as uh, as uh, as an ideal that we want to to achieve, uh, and it is often uh, the case when we see the conflating uh, versions of history in today, because uh, uh, these versions of history start to integrate uh, uh, values in them. Uh, this also works in terms of uh, reliving the historical past, uh, which uh, also comes to the fore in the modern times in the European societies. Well, uh, uh, this reliving of uh, history um, is characterized with a double encoding system on the one and we are borrowing from the classical antiquity, the Kronos idea of time, the empty time, which uh, may be filled with events or, or, or even be continue to be um, continue to be empty. So it is the decades, centuries, millennia, um, and uh, as we have heard uh, today, uh, even kings have uh, have uh, empty days when rien happens, uh, as in in the in the quoted uh, diary of Louis says. Um, uh, this system of encoding is uh, superimposed with the with the uh, legacy of Abrahamic uh, um, Old Testament uh, culture and. Uh, Thence uh, and from there, we uh, we borrow this uh, prophetic expectation 
of uh, of uh, uh, of the major plan to come to life, major plan of history. Uh, we expect uh, from history either salvation or cataclysms. And so uh, history becomes a drama. History becomes an expectation. History becomes uh, uh, either um, a, um, uh, an, an impatient uh, uh, um, nostalgia for the past. And besides, in this form of, uh, of intellectual tradition, uh, there is a, a special encoding uh, of the past. There is a, a staple perception that history books uh, preserve history, although, uh, as uh, it was brilliantly uh, shown this morning, uh, we have a, a, a very multifaceted uh, system of relations with our own history. So um, if, uh, if history keeps, uh, if history books keep, keep history is, is an open question. But uh, the uh, contents of archives, museums, or archaeology sites uh, is somewhat different from the perception of history in the modern societies. Um, a modern society is dynamic. It is believed to be swiftly developing. Uh, and so uh, there is this accumulation of the past, um, and these relics uh, need to be classified and filtered. And stored in uh, in uh, uh, in some places um, like museums or or history departments. So the 20th century adds a new dimension. It is uh, the dimension of uh, treating the traumatic uh, history, which follows the same logic. The German experience tells us uh, that uh, the traumatic uh, past must be relieved uh, or processed, uh, and unless uh, uh, this work is done, the past will stop to be past. So we work with traumatic past for the past to remain past, and for it not to ev elope into the future. And uh, I'm not going to, uh, and I think uh, Nikolai will, 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 will uh, uh, speak more uh, about it. Uh, But this uh, f uh, form of mind, uh, uh, this uh, is is more characteristic for the nation states uh, era, for the so-called public sphere to evolve, uh, and uh, history is becoming uh, a, a, a matter of public discourse. Of, uh, and uh, and there is uh, of course uh, the um, uh, the other side of the medal, like censorship and uh, attempts to manipulate history. But these are um, still the times of the nation states, uh, the time when uh, people start thinking in group theory. Uh, logic, uh, like uh, nation states or Marxian classes, uh, and uh, uh, what Marx uh, wrote, uh, wrote about this is the type of consciousness, uh, which uh, also came to the fore through um, through historical uh, uh, narratives. So history starts uh, to. Uh, become this totality of grant narratives are directed at different large groups of people. These narratives also seek to combine um, these groups for mobilization or for other ends. What is happening uh, to uh, this discourse uh, today? I uh, shall... Uh, um, allow myself making uh, a point which may be uh, debated. I think that these grand narratives um, of history uh, no longer work. I think they no longer uh, uh, 
make uh, or perform the functions which they seemed to even several decades ago. I think that in different societies, including Russia, um, there is a, a big number of people, still a big uh, considerable um, a number of people who think uh, that uh, um, uh, old tasks uh, can still be solved in uh, in today's new conditions. But it doesn't seem to work because once we see another grand narrative coming to the public, to the public space, it no longer uh, unites people, but uh, indeed severs people apart. Uh, indeed, disjoins people, leads to a disjunction, and the society is polarized even further with every new grand narrative coming to the fore, which is certainly something that we're seeing in Russia today. Thus, the strength of these narratives is still there, but it's very inertia-based. When we're riding a car, we feel uh, inertia um, when uh, uh, the car changes gear and uh, it appears uh, or the driver changes gear, and this is what is happening uh, with the society. What is the reason and cause uh, for uh, for the loss of these grand narratives of their function? I think that there is uh, one uh, cause. Most importantly, is uh, some uh, very deep uh, transformation that the that the entire world is going through. Through it's a society um, shift. Uh, and this transformation can be manifested in different ways. So let us take the e uh, economy. Uh, the economy becomes uh, and multiplies uh, forms of production. And we are integrated into this uh, process of production according to different uh, 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 principle. So it's a post Ford, post Taylor um, age, uh, and uh, we can no longer act in in the logic of a uh, Ford's car conveyor. Um, possibly and uh, partially because uh, the society relationships uh, have. Uh, evolved and the public sphere is also changing. Uh, in post-Fordian era, even uh, the unqualified uh, uh, workforce uh, uh, gains a voice. And the public space uh, is more and more uh, replete with empty talk. This empty talk uh, um, is a reflection of the changing uh, relations in the society. The public sphere is uh, differentiated. And apart from these grand narratives, uh, we are seeing uh, many other sidelines. Uh, the different versions of the alternative history, local histories, uh, histories of... Uh, of uh, uh, the defeated uh, history of the minorities, uh, history of, uh, uh, say, gender-specific um, uh, histories, uh, like, say, the women in the Renaissance times, uh, as an example. Or uh, um, could then the grand narratives uh, interact with all these uh, sidelines is a big question. Besides... Like it or not, but uh, as a result of this global transformation, we are uh, more and more uh, under the influence of uh, consumption-based uh, society. And thus, history is also becoming an object of uh, consumption. Even in the post-Ford era, production is still more or less collective uh, um, uh, process, uh, even though it may be less so than in Ford's days, but uh, Henry Ford's days, um, for that matter. Uh, and uh, history is uh, thus uh, branching out into multiple uh, lines, as, or as I said, sidelines, um, of course, and each sideline is a principal line if you take this particular line as uh, to follow. So, um, 
this shows, uh, and this is reflected in the keen interest with which people tell their personal narratives, their lives with their photos, uh, remarks, comments uh, in, say, the social media. So uh, <coughs> consumption is uh, impossible. In the, in the past or in the future, consumption is always instantaneous. It's something that is happening here and now. So uh, we are often talking not about uh, history nowadays, but memory, because memory is the past which is present here and now. And in the past several decades, uh, this notion of historical memory came to curb the uh, notion of uh, history as a grand narrative. So. What we're seeing is some, some vacuum, which is related to the fact that we live in this, uh, 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 in this uh, intermittent time, when the grand, uh, grand uh, narrative uh, have uh, stopped uh, uh, to be um, as significant as uh, previously, and uh, the new ways of treating uh, history are not uh, uh, as uh, um, fully encompassing uh, uh, the public focus um, as before. What do we see under these uh, conditions? We can see in these conditions that this uh, vacuum uh, is uh, filled with nostalgia, with propaganda, with populism, and yesterday uh, there was, uh, the, the, in one of the um, uh, presentations, we heard uh, uh, this cartography of emotions, and in particular the cartography of fear, fear uh, very quick to come and fill the void. So we are also seeing uh, a radicalization uh, and uh, growth of um, fundamentalism, which is also, as I said, um, characteristic uh, for the times when the grand narratives uh, fail. We're often told in Russia today about the traditional values that the Russian society must go back to. But, uh, of course, uh, these traditional values are nothing but, uh, but a product of today, <laughs> of, uh, of uh, an attempt by today's politicians to breed uh, uh, something uh, uh, of a simulacrum which is also an attempt to f fill in this, uh, this vacuum left by the dying out of the grand narratives. Um, so the future of the past, as the name of this session um, uh, goes, what could, uh, what could be the future? Uh, I shall allow myself uh, to, uh, to uh, 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 quote, Douglas North, a Nobel Prize winner uh, in economics, uh, who uh, spoke about the open access and limited access to resources um, in society development. North uh, argues that if uh, there is a, a considerable substantial resource available in a particular society that there may be open access to, access to this resource. And in this case, sooner or later, Violence will be reigned, uh, democratic uh, procedures will prevail, uh, equality of opportunities uh, will uh, gradually be installed, and the resource itself is gradually seen as, uh, as a matter of accretion or a, a logic of, accum of growth. Uh, expanding markets uh, and the resources um, being multiplied as the new participants come into the market on the one hand. On the other hand, if uh, uh, there is um, a group, a dominating group in the society which is uh, based uh, entirely on limited uh, access to this resource, then uh, it will uh, certainly be um, this, this regime of limited access will be self-reproduced. Uh, and then 
it's not just uh, that the access is uh, limited, that the resource itself is viewed as limited. It is seen as a, a matter of waning uh, resource. And the more participants, uh, the uh, less pie there is. It's a zero-sum game approach. What is uh, history to do with it? If history is a resource, it's, if it's a symbolic resource of the past, that means that an access to this resource may be described in similar logic. For instance, uh, if we take, uh, if we hear that this is our past, we're not allowing anybody to, to encroach on it, or to rewrite it, or to manipulate it, or to uh, 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 to tarnish it. Then this is a matter of limited access uh, to the resource. In this case, the resource of history, as we see it. And in the, in the particular case, we start talking about falsifying of history and so on and so forth. But. I think that future of the past lies exactly in our ability uh, to have open access to history, participatory history as a term I would like to propose. And uh, there are many uh, examples of such history. I will uh, but quote uh, a uh, few examples which are well known. This is uh, the British example of uh, Butown uh, uh, district, which uh, used to be a socially vulnerable working class district uh, which had uh, this uh, public uh, open access uh, history which allowed to integrate personal histories of uh, of residents uh, with the overall um, society history this led uh, to a, a big uh, blossoming of uh, various uh, cultural uh, and historical um, events uh, and uh, uh, there is uh, yet another term of the post-avalanche um, era. And here we're talking about the 2011 New York Times article about the avalanche coming down, which is, uh, this, uh, uh, which is uh, often viewed uh, as uh, the first big uh, uh, interactive uh, material. But uh, one should not forget uh, that this is uh, not just uh, an interactive material, but something uh, which is uh, which uh, relates uh, to to the uh, particip uh, participants of the events. There are a lot of examples like this in in Russia or attempts. Uh, um, I will just uh, quote uh, one project, which I think uh, is a very nice uh, attempt. I um, came across it uh, in a long list of one of the funds or endowments uh, supporting contemporary history, mm, contemporary art, I'm sorry. <coughs> uh, there are uh, several uh, high-rise uh, buildings of Soviet era in Moscow which are circular. And it was believed that the residents of such buildings would come uh, and uh, sort of befriend in the circular areas, the yards or the... But very often, as, as, as this is perfectly understood, uh, the residents of these uh, circular high-rise buildings uh, hardly spend any time in these circular areas, which was sought to be uh, their communal space. One uh, uh, day, um, 
uh, somebody uh, starts uh, drawing uh, bed linen in the middle of this uh, circular uh, area, which is, of course, a tradition which is long gone uh, in, um, in, in Moscow. And then it turns out that these blankets, uh, uh, which are uh, uh, thought to be to be uh, to be drying out, have the histories of the residents of this building to uh, uh, written on them. And people come to read. People come to read, and this uh, this uh, circular area, uh, uh, inner area of these high rise buildings, uh, stop being uh, uh, emasculated. Uh, uh, totally uh, uh, empty and unnecessary space, but indeed become a focus for residents uh, to interact and communicate, which is, uh, I think, um, a happy example of uh, uh, treating personal history in a humane way. Uh, do we believe that grand uh, historical narratives are still possible within this logic? Uh, I do not know. I have no answer to this. And those narratives, the grand historical narratives which are in crisis today, are the ones which uh, which uh, evolved in uh, under the conditions of limited access to history. If uh, we can. Uh, reproduce uh, grand historical uh, narratives in uh, the open access uh, uh, environment, this will be a different uh, experience. And uh, this experience uh, will uh, uh, be related to the contemporary and modern tendencies of civic uh, activism and the uh, public uh, sphere. And this, uh, if I may uh, uh, stop and uh, give the floor to my colleague. Thank you. Dear colleagues, we agreed. Like the common <coughs> sense should tell us both the experts first have their say, and then we'll have a Q&A and a comment session. You will make your choice whether you ask a question to both speakers or you ask a question to one of them, but this will be done only after we have heard what Nikolai Epley has to say. Dmitry and I, we agreed we would swap places because he gives such, rather puts like theory um, piece, and I, I give practical illustrations. And let me begin with this very personal note, a personal note. This is a seminar for journalists. And probably it would be the right thing to do for me to begin with a comment that work with the past, on the past, I was pushed to do it after, because of my, as a, uh, worked as a journalist. Well, I several years spent working for via, the Via Domestia, and I'm thankful to Tatiana Lesova, who is present here for, for 12 years. If I'm not making some mistake here, was the head of this newspaper, the best business newspaper of Russia in political and social. And Maxim Trubalyov, a great friend of this school, and I worked under him in the comments rubric. And this experience actually is the one who works on society and analysis of what is going on in the... This is something that would be taking us to the thing that the memory and these untied knots from our past turn out to be it is out in order to comment what is going on right now. It turns out you need to know and understand what was happening in the past. And we keep stumbling and we keep stumbling on this one and the same thing. It's curious uh, from the journalist's perspective that they, something that enjoys highest popularity in the business newspaper, it turns out that it is a purely historical article by Leo Kolivniuk about the Grand Terror, that the award of the editorial board for 2017 is given to the three pieces dedicated to the reprisals. They are articles by Borten, 
the case of Khatabic, the case of Novocherkask firing uh, when the peaceful demonstration was fired at. And uh, we have somebody from 7 by 7. Yes, they also published something. When, again, a journalist story, when the first experience of joint brainstorm of the journalists of a major number of um, publishers and the memorial. It was known as Media Hokaton, which we had in October on the eve of the Day of Remembrance of the victims of the political reprisals. It resulted in two dozen publications about the Great Terror, about the memory, and in general, which really produced the waves, so to say, uh, contrary to the information gender, which is dictated by the top authorities. It's something typical of today's journalism, not only analyze, do investigative journalism, but know how to bring together disunited pieces. It's a pretty, well, uh, interesting comparison. Grigory Osipichvinakur says that philology cannot be hard as science because it doesn't have an object to study. Uh, it's objective to give the reader written monuments. If this is the treatise of Aristotle about animals, then the objective of the philologist give a zoological commentary. And the uh, profession of journalism is in some way similar. For good reason, there are good people with arts and letters background. Uh, let, to let the society be in touch with the reality they live in, if in under these conditions, this is something that requires a comment by a historian, by a psychiatrist. It means now it is part of the journalist's job. In the last two years, the conversation about how Russia is haunted by its past, it moved away from academic spheres to the front lines in the media, front pages, sorry, of the media. And as was perfectly seen in the uh, anniversary of the revolution and 80 years of the Grand Terror, it is quite a selective approach towards the Grand Terror. But the state only thinks they are socially in charge of the narrative. Very often it turns out that it is the narrative that is in charge and seeking to shut down some conversation about history, try to somehow direct the conversation, conduct this conversation for one's political agenda without first looking into this past, without burying the corpses, without condemnation of the crimes. It turns out in the fact that these topics are like blocks that prevent us from moving forward. A very recent example, my personal example, to which extent it may turn into minefield, the topic of the difficult past, if you just try to shut it down. Several days ago, the Orthodox Christians celebrated the Epiphany, and the president dipped into icy water in the monastery of Nila Stolobinska Monastery. Every media wrote about this. Nobody really paid any attention that actually Nila Stolobinska Postel was in 1941. It was a camp by NKVD where they had a number of those Polish uh, officers who would be later fired at, uh, fired, executed on this, as the speaker says, was what cutting was about. I wrote about it on Facebook. It became the most popular record in, I don't know, 10 years, 500 reposts. To which extent this, how close it all is. And the fact that how it can, this uh, reckoning with the past can be done, the country has been arguing a bit about since the late 1980s. The state is not against about remembering the memory of the dead, but they say but it's not prepared to start the true investigation. It's no longer considered to be a safe civic activity. You all know the case of Dmitri. In its turn, 
alongside with the erection of the monument to the victims, the state continues to underline, to stress the continuity of the law enforcement, uh, even to the hundreds of millions of broken lives. Well, the memorial organization comes up with its own approach to overcoming the Soviet past, but the memorial and similar initiatives are incapable to help society. They can help the society, but they can't do it instead of the society. We have a very difficult picture where the state and historical policy is ambiguous and the civil society is weak, is disunited and cannot come up with its own single agenda or program. But many of our colleagues, it just says that in Russia, overcoming the Soviet past is impossible. It's not in demand by the majority. It's impossible because of the country's people's mentality and so on. But exactly that similar objectives were faced stand in the way that Russia is a unique and, and is alone in this field, and nobody else has been facing it. Actually, in the last four decades, similar objectives were faced with greater or lesser success by dozens of countries. There are disciplines in place that try to categorize and bring together this mostly transitional justice, memory studies, but in a surprising way in Russia in the public field. The conversation about for an example is limited almost almost by to Germany. And there is a dissidents or near dissident discourse that one needs to new Nuremberg trial over the bloody regime and nothing else. Whereas much more something prevalent of compromise, the Commission on Truth and Reconciliation model of transitional contract is not present in the public field. I've been working on a project where, based upon the analysis of foreign experience, we are attempting to describe the scenarios that Russia could take up. I'll give you four examples from the history of the four countries. The first example is Argentina. The Argentinian model is one of the quite comparatively successful transition from dictatorship, from the junta, junta of the 1973-76, to the imperfect yet, admittedly, but democracy. A transition that took place under the pressure of society to a considerable extent. First, it looks all looks like a very, very limited measures to make accountable. First, they get sentences, leaders of the junta, then they even may be convicted and go to jail, but then in a couple of years they set free. It's all like frozen. But it's interesting that after some after a while, the civil society makes a state to finish the story. Interesting how one can enforce the society to, well, it's an exciting example when we can see in a situation where the civil society has no instruments of uh, putting the pressure on the government and on its policy. What are the mechanisms and tools in place? In 1990s, where on the one hand, we saw more and more publications, more and more facts about the crimes of the junta and became known to the public, made public. Law, human rights organizations become more, come to the fore. On the other hand, uh, some laws have been adopted that block work on the condemnation of those who were guilty. And there is consensus, very much like in Russia, that you'd better stay away from breaking the past, as the Russian saying goes. Well, uh, but the relatives, the family members of the victims are there, they are alive. And I'm not saying, I won't discuss an um, exciting story of the um, mothers of the Square of Maya. It is well known, it is a simple example. 
However, uh, one of the instruments are courts of truth, semi-legal instrument. These ju courts cannot, um, because there is a law on amnesty that was adopted, the courts cannot fully make the um, criminals criminally accountable. Uh, but the judges know it and the victims' families know it, appealing to the right to the truth as one of human rights, the right to know what happened to their family members. Some individual judges start proceedings on these applications, and it's not quite a legal process. There is no such thing as prosecution, but they hear out the witnesses, they demand that those against whom the court uh, case is going, proceeding, they want them to report to court. The courts require that information from the archives is made available. And there is there's no way to condemn those who are guilty. But the discussions do take place, and this conversation does take place in society. And the courts of truth lead with time to the fact that in the late 1990s, they begin from the start, those who were members of the junta. Another interesting way, I never heard anybody discuss it. Again, making people uh, delinquent through organization daughters and sons for justice and against oblivion. The members of the organization started to carry out scratches, that is, mass walking uh, remembrance walks to the places of residence where the perpetrators live in order to expose uh, their doings. Um, it is a symbol of uh, the civic activity and a blend with carnivals. They are pertinent of the culture. They use the music, the slang word would be de to the cocoon. They broadcast light broadcasts, the recordings from the court proceedings, or the witnesses' accounts. And altogether, this brings about this background noise, sort of, that makes the state to again reinitiate court proceedings. Another example would be Spain. A good example for Russia. A very for a very long time, uh, the consent of society to forget about former divisions for the unity of the nation. Indeed, that was a uh, transition by contract, by agreement, and for a long while the conversation about the past was sort of stopped. But in general, Franco died in 1975 or 76. In the year 2000, when it actually becomes the uh, generation of the grandchildren of Franco victims, a phenomenon of mass exhumations. A surprising story that really woke up the country. A journalist, her name was Emilia Silva, as she was impressed to his relatives, who went to the, writes an article about his grandfather. He writes that it's strange that Spain welcomes the arrest by Pinochet, whereas our judge Baltasar Garzón initiates courts hearings in Argentina. Similar things happen in Guatemala, but nothing is happening like this. My father is very much a victim, very much like this. He leaves his address. Under the pressure of those who write to him here, together with a 
wants to start an organization to restore historic memory. And by the end of these five years, they could make exhumation of 60 mass graves. The remains of about a thousand people have been identified. Now it is a matter of dozens of thousands. Regional chapters are set up that attract more and more historians, anthropologists, historians. And in fact, that wave, the phenomenon of mass exhumation, puts the end of this pact of silence. The state has to, in 2007, adopt a law on historic memory, which considerably uh, changes the situation. A second example is the next thing about Spain. In the year 2008, it is 10 years after the arrest of Pinochet, the same Garzón, and uh, Pinochet was arrested because of his court case against him, starts a case, he supports the cases uh, that appealed to the court of 15 NGOs. They say that the number of those missing is 114,000. First, he wants raise a question about legal qualification of the Franco regime in this lawsuit. Remember the case of Garagotin. Garzón is immediately accused of abusing his power, but hundreds of thousand people go out into the streets of Madrid to support him in this way. Although, in the year 2010, the Spanish human rights organizations together with the Argentinian law enforcement, including the legendary mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, uh, go to law to the court of Buenos Aires to consider the crimes uh, of Franco regime against humanity. And the uh, rule on universalism applies to such crimes. Argentina several times appeals to Spain to give those involved and to initiate a case. Spain refuses. and. Uh, it's quite a recent story. By the year 2013, 88-year-old daughter of one of those murdered then takes a plane and goes to Argentina. There she joins this lawsuit. And in 2017, that was last year, the first case, when the state, under these criminal proceedings, identifies the remains of her father and at the public expense, reburies him at the in Madrid, at a Madrid cemetery. Uh, this is Asuncion Dieta is 91 now, and her case turns out to be the most important precedent, because as they look for her, his father, they identified a dozen more people, and now their relatives know how what to do about it about legal proceedings. Well, there's little time left, and I would like to regrettably admit interesting examples from the history of this of South Africa. We had a most exciting Commission on Truth and Reconciliation, and just a thing I wish to mention. In South Africa, debates are popular. How did it really work? It's known that South African example is contradictory, to put the least. Put it mildly, a well-known sociologist, James Gibson, wrote a book that got all possible academic awards. It means overcoming apartheid. Can truth reconcile a divided nation? And he raises the question, how do you measure reconciliation? What do you do? He identifies, he puts forward several points as he surveys whether people agree or disagree with it, people who are citizens of South Africa. It finds out to the extent at which people agree with the facts that were exposed by this commission. The relations between the members of society can change. Not automatically, not, but uh, and, uh, 
we think that how important it is not only to condemn mass reprisals. One needs some system of categories. What is it that we condemn? Not just some specific or concrete criminal crimes. Let me enumerate them. Maybe there is, you have to agree, say yes or no. Apartheid was a crime against humanity. Yes. Certainly, yes, when apartheid was in place, there were some abuses, but the ideas were fundamentally good. No. Fight for the preservation of apartheid was fair and right. No. Those who fought for apartheid and worked against it at that committed crimes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Abuses in the years of apartheid, for the most part, were um, committed by individual criminals and not by state institutions. No. So much for your contemplation. How to formulate it for Russia. And the last example is pretty difficult. It's very easy to commit some generalizations because today they spoke at length about it. But it seems important to highlight that uh, what matters is problematic cases when this work was not finalized. And in every case, in Argentina, Spain, in South Africa, it's not something that has been finalized. But Poland was just that we are watching our, our eyes. It's interesting to cons look at the outburst of xenophobic and conservative trends that we see now rising in Poland after the victory in the elections of this right party. So she says right and justice, it could be seen as uh, lessons that were not learned. Poland is also considered to be a quite a successful example of transition from communist dictatorship to democracy. But it was by compact. Yes, it happened. It was a bloodless transition, it happened pretty fast. And after shock reforms, Poland, given the scale of the problems, pretty successfully started to integrate into the European community. But that transit was came through compact, through agreement. Here one mentioned discussions and negotiations at Magdalian and the Round Table. And this transition put preserved the communist elites as safe. The conversation about broad illustration about the responsibility of former leadership was under those conditions impossible. The most famous <coughs> point of the Mazowiecki about a very fat like very thick line. This is an analog of amnesty in Spain and Argentina. As a result of which, the communist elites comfortably distanced themselves from responsibility in 89 and 90, and solidarity had to take the country out of the economic catastrophe. The Democrats collected all the negative things. And the communists and post-communists ensured a possibility of revenge. And interesting statistics is that in 89, the support figures for Communist Party in Jaruzelski were about 2-3%, I might be mistaken, and the Communist Party pretty f soon is disbanded. Well, but back in 1994, as early as 1994, rating f for Jaruzelski, who left, is twice that of Valencia. That data is also available. And 71% of Poland say uh, that uh, martial law that was introduced was well justified. And overwhelming majority say they were much, felt much more secure under communism. And communists are back to parliament. Kwasniewski was elected former member of the Polish United Workers' Party. And the party of law and justice, its backbone is made up of radical anti-red, anti-communists who back in 1989 would refrain from negotiations and would put the blame on the participants of that, uh, of those people, blame them of collaborism. And the most important thing about this thing. Uh, 
So uh, the general uh, statement is that uh, the fourth Reg Pospolita must be reinstalled, and uh, Mr. Valesa uh, is being um, um, criticized or even accused of collaborationism. So the subject of uh, uh, of uh, struggle against the communism becomes still uh, after 30 years, uh, uh, 30 years after the fall of the system, continues to fuel the public debate. It appears uh, that uh, uh, because uh, of uh, the so-called uh, moral authorities of uh, many communists. Uh, uh, retained after the fall of their system, uh, the um, Democrats and uh, reformers, part of them at least, uh, may even go as far as uh, try and rethink uh, the past. So uh, there is this uh, uh, policy of national pride, uh, which is uh, seen as uh, uh, as uh, the sacred cow of, uh, and and there is this attempt uh, to uh, to say that the Yevabna pogrom story is uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, exaggerated, and there are even attempts uh, uh, to uh, re-view uh, re and uh, rethink there is the law on criminalization of the Polish uh, death camps. So this uh, law has been uh, adopted uh, because the Ida uh, film uh, is uh, viewed as a defamation. And the head of the Polish center in Berlin is uh, fired for exaggerating attention to the Jewish theme, which is a part of a wider picture in November, the European Parliament adopts a resolution on uh, conducting a check of uh, Poland's uh, conformity with the European values, which may become the first in history precedent of sanctions against uh, Poland. The resolution states uh, the fact of a fascist March in Warsaw last year. <clears throat> the uh, inability and unpreparedness of the society to deliberate these topics and to, to speak about them honestly turns to become an inhibitor in uh, any public discourse. So uh, the conclusions are clear, but most importantly, um, these were just but a few examples, but it is evident that first that uh, the untreated past comes back with the ve vengeance <coughs> and uh, uh, like uh, ulcers, uh, these, uh, um, these will continue to uh, mature in uh, the uh, nether parts of the society and would burst uh, through flesh one day. And the Polish example here is specifically illustrative. Um, the ability to critically consider one's own past and to extract the lessons is not uh, this is uh, uh, indeed a result of constant effort and not something granted. And a critical attitude towards history, the ability to talk uh, about the difficult pages, is one of the uh, musts for a healthy state and society today. Thank you.